Well, hello and welcome to this week's Bible study. Let's start with prayer. Father, bless the study. Bless the words that we find in the scriptures that we may be more like Jesus and they may be teach us more about our God. Now we pray that you will bless each of us and forgive us when we feel short. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello again. Uh, we're going to be working through the 15th chapter of, uh, of the great book of 1 Corinthians uh, this morning. At least we'll get through probably about a third of it uh, today. Uh, just by kind of way of reminder, uh, chapter 11, uh, Paul was dealing with some problems with which were taking place that were abuses of the Lord's Supper. Uh, notably, uh, a, a meal, I guess you'd say, that, that was, had been added, uh, called an agape meal or a love feast. And this had begun to detract from the, the Lord's Supper. And, and Paul effectively used language that, that, that separated those two forever because he wanted everything in the Lord's Supper to be about Jesus, about the Savior, and about remembering Him. Uh, so it, it's interesting in this book how he, he takes problems and gives great timeless biblical teachings. Then we move into chapters 12, 13, and 14. Uh, he's teaching regarding some, uh, some understanding of spiritual gifts, uh, and he gives some wonderful teachings throughout that uh, next, uh, through those three chapters, specifically chapter 13, which was just one of the most... Uh, positive and encouraging books in all the New Testament, the great chapter on love. But in the end, it instead of it being about, about spiritual gifts and who had them and who didn't have them, what they, what they were, what was important, what wasn't important, it became about making sure that we do something to edify others and not ourselves. So that in the end, the Father is glorified. Uh, that, that is kind of the overarching picture and and Paul is a master of that, uh, just taking these taking these problems that were in the church and fixing them, and at the same time giving some te teachings which are just timeless. The same thing's going to happen here in in chapter uh, fifteen. Uh, Paul is going to uh, give the the most inclusive and and beautiful teaching on the resurrection uh, that that we have in all the New Testament. Uh, in fact. On, on the occasion of any funeral that you almost ever go to, the speaker almost invariably comes around to giving a teaching from 1 Corinthians 15 uh, because it's just it's just such a such an amazing teaching on the importance of the resurrection and the encouragement that it brings as Christians uh, in times of loss, in times of struggle, in times of difficulties. 1 Corinthians 15 is just a reminder. In the end. Jesus rose again, and so will we. And that is that is just our purpose in in existence as we as we serve our Father. Uh, so before we start, let's turn to First Corinthians fifteen, the twelfth chapter, because it's important. To, I'm so sorry. First Corinthians fifteen, chapter the twelfth verse, and I want to read that because if, to understand this uh, this chapter and appreciate what the the apostles is doing here. It's important. So in verse 12 he says, Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? I mean, that is the problem. Uh, and, and all this other is wrapped around uh, the, this, 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 this problem that Paul is dealing with where we have some false teachers in the Corinthian church who are disputing Paul's teaching and saying that there is no resurrection of the dead. And in this comes one of the absolutely most beautiful and powerful teachings that we have in all of the New Testament. So looking forward to beginning to work through that. So let's go back uh, to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, start with the first verse. We'll probably work through about, uh, I'm going to say about verse 19 today, uh, and then we'll, we'll continue on. This, this, this particular chapter may take two or three weeks to, to actually work through. So now... Uh, now keep in mind he's just he's just finished uh, his discourse on on uh, on uh, spiritual gifts and so he's kind of <clears throat> so he's going on to a different subject here. Now I make known to you, brother, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand. I mean, so Paul, if you go all the way back to Acts the 18th chapter, when Paul spent a considerable amount of time, and, and we've talked about this earlier in the book, Paul was the Paul was the person who who came to Corinth, who brought the gospel, and started the church. And 
uh, he, he kind of reminds them periodically through this that, hey, I was the one, you believed it, and you're still faithful to it. I mean, that's the idea here. So, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand. You, you are still currently uh, professing and worshiping and, and uh, being Christians. Uh, so, starts off encouraging there. Uh, which you are also saved, if you hold fast. Now, if you go back and study the book of, of Hebrews, uh, one of the interesting anomalies of Hebrews is there's multiple, multiple occasions where the, the writer is giving us teachings that our, our faith, our, our salvation is conditional upon us remaining faithful, standing fast. And, and Paul uses that same thing, that same idea here where as long as we continue to do those things which keep us into a relationship with the Father, we, we have no question of our salvation. But it is ours to squander. Uh, God has done everything that He needs to do on His side. Now it's up to us. And, and these are the verses that we look at that, that help give us pause and, 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 and give us encouragement to remain faithful. Because listen to what He says. By, with, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast... The word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. I mean, the, the, I, the to me those are just sometimes not so subtle, and in this particular case, somewhat subtle. Uh, a teaching that, that says, "Hey, Christianity is something that requires effort from the time you become a Christian until the end, and holding fast to your faith is something that's very important." Continues on, verse three. Uh, Really, verse three, verse. I guess you would say verses three through nine. Uh, Paul is giving some some instructions, kind of a summary of of, uh, of, 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 of what had happened with Jesus and and uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find the right words. I think it it's it's almost a summary of the gospel. It's almost a summary of the story of Jesus and then how that that perpetuated back during the time uh, that the Savior was crucified and, and immediately thereafter. So let's let's work through that. Verse three. For I delivered to you as of first importance. I mean, this is the this is the piece that is that is a foundational piece of, of our faith, uh, and and these Christians' faith back in in uh, in Corinth. I mean, Paul is just saying this is something that is pivotal to us becoming and believing in Jesus Christ. For I delivered to you as of first importance, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, that He was buried. And that he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. I mean, that is the absolute fundamental statement of our faith, of, of belief. We believe that Jesus Christ came to this world. He was the Son of God. He was killed, crucified for our sins. He was buried for three days. And he rose again and defeated death through the power of the Father. I mean, that's the essence of, 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 of the Christian of, of the Christian's conscience and, and, and the Christian's belief in Jesus Christ as, as the Son of God. And, and, and this is, so Paul is kind of just, just giving this summary. And he's beginning this process of talking about the, the, uh, the, the process of resurrection because that, that is the, the piece that, that, is, that is being questioned at this point. And, and I want us to appreciate the resurrection is the vital piece of our faith. I mean, acknowledging that Jesus was the Son of God, acknowledging that He lived a perfect, sinless life, acknowledging, acknowledging that He was He was killed for our sins. Those those are things that others have claimed. The thing that separates Jesus, that proves everything about what He said, was the fact that the Father raised Him from the dead. I mean, that is the power of the gospel. And as as Paul is going through this, he's going to you know he kind of talked about that he was killed buried resurrected you know the, the, the this this threefold piece of Jesus's last few days we're not going to begin focusing in on the on the resurrection so but then he continues on in verse 5 and I keep in mind this is things that happened directly right after the uh, right after the, uh, the the his his uh, resurrection and then he appeared to Cephas Peter and then to the 12 so he, he was to Peter then to, then to the, the, the other apostles, and that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, 
but son have fallen asleep. I think this is what we would call high evidential value. I mean, that, this, is, this, is, this is something that, that, that Paul is looking at to say, hey, this wasn't just something that we, the apostles, are telling, telling the story about. 500 people saw him after his death. I mean, that is, that is, that is evidence and proof of the fact that he, that he arose after being killed and remaining in the grave for three days. Some, and, and he said some of these people are still, and I keep in mind at the time he was writing this was about 30 years or so after Jesus had died and risen again. Uh, some, many of those are still alive, but some of them had actually passed away. Verse 7, then he appeared to James. Now, the James that is, is likely referred to there would be James, his brother. Uh, James had become, we learned it back in Acts, one of the, the principal leaders of the church there in, in Jerusalem. Uh, a very influential and important person. He also would be the person who wrote the book that we refer to as James. Uh, then appeared James into all the apostles. And last of all, I mean, this is kind of, he's kind of giving, going down a, a list of people who had, had witnessed him a, after he had resurrected. And last of all, as to one untimely born, and Paul was not, he, he was not able to, to be with Jesus at the time he was on the earth. Untimely born, he says. But listen to what he says. Last of all, to one who is untimely born, he appeared to me also. And, and we get some insight on this, I believe, in Galatians. And boy, listen to the humility of the great apostle here uh, as he as he talks about uh, his apostleship. His apostleship, and and we've talked about this in the past. The apostles who were with Jesus, the you know the the eleven, and then Matthias, who was chosen to replace, pardon me, Judas. They walked with Jesus. They were with Jesus. Everybody knew that. I mean, their their apostleship was without question. Paul's, in many cases, even though we refer to him as the great apostle to the to the Gentiles, all of these missionary journeys, all these great things that he did in his life, he was still routinely questioned and challenged about his apostleship and having to go through steps to kind of document and prove his apostleship. And that's somewhat of what he's doing right here. Verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, we have a couple of stories from Acts about, about this man at the time, Saul, uh, and his, his efforts, his zealous efforts toward, uh, toward trying to crush the way, crush Christianity. Uh, he did everything he could around Jerusalem, and then at some point he went into the Sadducees and got letters so that he could begin to go out to other cities. I don't think we have really a uh, the, the total scope of, of his efforts. Uh, and the reason I say that is when, you know, we kind of pick up the story there is he's on, on the road to Damascus, and when he's on his road to Damascus, uh, Jesus appears to him, he's stricken blind, goes into Damascus, he has subsequently had his vision restored and wants to kind of be engage with the church. And the Christians there were scared of him because of his reputation. I mean, he he had done this in other places. He had he had proven that he was that he was against Christianity. And when when we talks about the persecution of the church, I just don't think we have the full picture of of the scope of all that Paul had done to try to destroy Christianity. And and here he's kind of he's he's alluding to that because I persecuted the church of God, but verse ten by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me did not prove in vain. I mean, it wasn't like God and Christ selected Paul, saved Paul made him a Christian, and then he just went on about doing life without, without any change. I mean, if there was ever a changed person, it was the great apostle Paul. And that was, his grace did not prove in vain. But I labored even more than all of them. He's talking about the other, the other apostles. I labored more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Uh, I mean, I, I just I, I'm I'm enamored by his by his humility. Uh, one of the greatest men to ever live. The person as responsible as any for for bringing Christianity full force into the Gentile world, which is us. Uh, what a debt of gratitude we have for this man. But his humility is just giving all the praise to God. Uh, I, I I love that about Paul. 
but the grace of God with me. Whether then it was I or they, it was, it was me or the other apostles, so we, so we preach and so you believed. I mean, that's kind of, at this point, talking to the, the Corinthian church there uh, and, and stressing the fact that as a result of him and the other apostles, the teachings that they've given, these people now have the opportunity to be followers of Jesus. Uh, so, we get to verse 12. Uh, now, verse 12, oh gracious, all the way through verse 34, we won't get that far today, but all the way over through verse 34, the great apostle is going to give a series of about nine, I guess arguments are, are, are a good way to look at it, nine arguments of, of the absurdity of rejecting uh, the resurrection, the idea of the resurrection. Uh, if this was in a court of law, he, 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 he's, he's laying out his case. He, he's giving, he's going to give out this, these bullet point lists of, of reasons why it's just absurd for us to, to or anybody at the time, uh, to reject the concept of, of the resurrection. Uh, and so let's begin in verse 12 again. We'll probably get down to about verse 20, 19, which will be 7, uh, and then we'll come up and finish up the next ones next week uh, as we as we work our way through this book. So, again, we've already read verse twelve, but again, this is the this is this is the the, the verse that helps us understand the whole the whole chapter. Now, if Christ is preached, which he just said he was in, in the previous verse, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do you, uh, how do those among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? I mean, it's just almost like this this rhetorical question that he's asking. This is what we've been preaching. This is why you become a Christian. And now some are saying that the resurrection didn't happen. It just doesn't make any sense. So he's going to begin to lay out his case, uh, his, his proof. Uh, and he begins with the first one in verse 13. Again, it's interesting the way Paul approaches this. He kind of approaches this from the negative side in this particular case, which is, which is, which is you know, you can kind of go about this either way. Uh, and I think he's hoping that there's a little bit of shock value. Uh, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of, 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 of shock in the realization of how absurd it is to even not consider the resurrection. I mean, again, I talked about this earlier. Without the res resurrection, we are not Christians. Without the resurrection, there is no reason to believe in Jesus because that is the proof. He fulfills prophecy. He had done all these demonstrations that he was from God with, with miraculous power, with, with raising the dead, with healing the sick, with, with causing the blind to see. I mean, all these things were being done, but it was the resurrection that gave the gospel power. It was, it was defeating death that gave the gospel its, its ability to, to, to teach us that there is more to come, that heaven is waiting. Uh, so let's begin, let's begin with the first one in verse 13. And again, these are kind of negative proofs that, that Paul arguments that Paul is giving. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. So I mean, I, I think he's going to get down to the basic of the point if, if we don't believe that Jesus came back from the dead, or if we don't believe in the resurrection and Jesus coming back from the dead, our whole religion is is mute. I mean, it is it is, is is it is of no value. Is where we're going. That's the first one. If there is no resurrection, Jesus died, and he's still in the grave. I mean, that's that's the idea of, of what the great apostles teaching here. Then in verse fourteen, and if Christ has not been raised, then this is number two. Our preaching is in vain, or our preaching is vain, which is basically. The, the apostles are lying to us. The apostles are telling falsehoods uh, because that's, that's what they're preaching on is that, that Jesus, is, Jesus has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching in vain. And then this is very important. And then number three, your faith is also in vain. The very thing that makes us Christians, the very thing that gives us hope, that gives us confidence Jesus rose from the dead and, 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 and gives us the assurance that we will also. Uh, that, is, that is vital to our, our importance. So that's, that's kind of the first three. Uh, not even Christ had been raised. Uh, if Christ had not been raised, the preachers in vain, the, 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 the apostles were not telling the truth. And then number three, our faith is in vain. Then he continues on with verse 15 with number four. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. So, I mean, again, a reiteration that the apostles are doing something inappropriate 
and, and basically not being truthful if this did not happen, if they were not witnesses of Jesus dying on the cross and walking again three days later. I mean, that is, that is again, that's the, the power of Christianity. That's the power of the gospel is the resurrection, the proof that Jesus was, as he claimed, the Son of God, and God raised him from the dead. Then he continues on. Now, number five is going to be in verses uh, verses 16 and 17. And boy, it's powerful. Uh, listen to this. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, listen to this. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. And you are still in your sins. I mean, appreciate as Christians, we have staked eternity. We have staked everything in our hope to be, to be, have our, our, our relationship with our God reestablished because of sin. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, that faith in Jesus Christ is worthless and we are still sinful and we are still, we are still destined for damnation. I mean, that's, that's the essence, I think, of what, of what the greatest apostle is saying. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Again, that's the, that would be the fifth argument that the apostle is giving of, of the absurdity in not believing in the resurrection. Again, all from the negative side. Then he continues on in verse 18. Then, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So, those at this point, you know, we're 30 years into it. We had Christians. They had subsequently lived faithfully, and then they had died. If Jesus was not resurrected from the dead... They have perished. They have, they have lost salvation. And they are not going to be reunited with the Father, but be punished eternally because of their sins. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the idea of, of what he's giving here. Those who have fallen asleep, that died, in Christ, Christians, have perished. I mean, they, they, have, they have lost all hope. There's nothing that can be done now to, to, give, them, to give them forgiveness, to give them to, to reestablish their relationship in some way with, with God. Uh, again, the absurdity. Uh, and the last one is going to come in, uh, in verse 19, and this is number 7. Again, there's going to be... Well, I'll talk about this in just a second. If we had hoped in Christ, and, and I love this because it really, I think, hits home as, to far, as far as to, to, to the pointed importance of the resurrection being believed... If we have hoped in Christ in this life, I mean, you think about it, we, we have put our entire eternity in the hands and our, of our belief in Jesus Christ. I mean, that is, that is the essence of being a Christian. Now, there are a lot of other religions out there. We have discounted those and we have put everything in Jesus. All, as, as the modern vernaculars, we put all of our eggs in one basket with, on our belief on Jesus. And it said, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. What a waste if we, if we put our faith in Jesus and it was a lie because he wasn't resurrected. I mean, that's to me, that is one that just should make us pause and, and appreciate our faith, appreciate the story, appreciate the proofs that we receive from the New Testament about, about this man Jesus living and dying and being buried and being resurrected. I mean, that is, that is the essence of Christianity, the essence of the gospel, the essence of our faith is the resurrection. And boy, Paul is doing just a masterful job of giving it. Now, we're going to stop there. Uh, kind of a short, uh, short one this week. Uh, we'll, we'll pick up with a little bit next week. Uh, verses 20 uh, through 28, Paul's going to take a... a I don't want to say a digression, but he's going to take a... He's going to, he's going to go and talk about something a little bit relating to the, uh, the, the resurrection and give some instruction. And then he's going to pick back up in verses 29 through 34 with this list of, of the nine different, uh, his points about the absurdity of, of, uh, of uh, not believing in the resurrection. So this is a good place to stop. Uh, and I think, it, I think it will be next week we can kind of pick up here, 
talk about this other, uh, I, I, I guess for the best word is just a digression. He's going to go off and talk about it's relating to the, to the, uh, to the resurrection, but it's not related to his, his proofs here in, the, in, these, in this argument. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a powerful, timeless, eternal teaching that, that's very important. And I want to put some time into that next week. Uh, so let's close with prayer. And then we'll look forward to continuing this great study uh, next week uh, as we continue with verse 20. Father, we're so very thankful for the great sacrifice of Jesus. And because of His love, because of Your love, we have faith. And we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. We have placed our faith in His, his life and His sacrifice and ultimately in His resurrection which demonstrates the power of our God and demonstrates that He was your Son as He claimed and gives us hope for salvation. It is our prayer that others may be convicted by these words. Bless our study this morning or this afternoon and, and may it be, it may have value to us, encourage us as Christians that, that we have chosen wisely in believing in Jesus. When we sin, forgive us, we ask. We pray these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen.